to be together again. It's good to know that God wants to lead us out of his word. I, I just want to mention a personal note. Uh, the last couple of weeks we've been doing name tags, and I know name tags can sometimes feel a little clunky, but uh, I, I asked that we could do it so that I could get to know your names better. And you know, it, it kind of warms my heart when I see folks putting up with that little bit of awkwardness just to help me out. And I just want to let you know I appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, today we want to continue in our uh, study in the book of John. We've been looking at the early days of Jesus' relationship with his disciples. And we've seen how uh, he has moved from relational activities with them, uh, spending time with them in, in John 1, going to a wedding together in John 2. Uh, out of that came some ministry as they observed him going down to Jerusalem and dealing with the, uh, with the Pharisees there, with the Jewish leaders. And so we're, we've been observing all of that. And uh, there's been various items we've been able to highlight and, and consider. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were looking at the passage where Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. And we saw that he really wanted to explain salvation to Nicodemus. He wanted him to understand that first and foremost, salvation is about spiritual transformation. So he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then he went on and he said, Nicodemus, I am the light of the world. I have come to bring about this spiritual transformation. So that was our our summary two weeks ago, that we can be transformed by the light of the world. And having thought about that, it's, it's great to understand that process in what was sort of a technical discussion between a, 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 a well-known teacher and Jesus. But today we want to go on and talk about how it gets modeled, what it really looks like in practice. <clears throat> And to help us with that, I thought I'd share the story of a woman named Laura. Uh, Laura's life got off to a difficult start. Uh, her parents didn't always get along. And so she speaks of when she was uh, a young woman, uh, just still in the home, hearing her parents argue and realizing that uh, she hadn't been planned and, and wasn't sure, she wasn't sure if they really loved her or not. She wasn't sure if she really belonged. And so that, that became a theme in her thinking, and it drew her down. It held her back. It caused her to make bad choices in her life. And so... Just as she was moving out on her own and getting to that place where she could accomplish something and make some personal choices to really go places with her life, she encountered difficulties. She didn't know where to turn. She had a tragic abortion, and that was heartbreaking for her. And then she went on into two marriages, and they failed. And that just left her, even though she had a couple, of a couple of lovely daughters, that just left her feeling aimless. That, that left her feeling lost, and she didn't know what to do. And so she, she, she tried to find something that would ground her. She tried to find some way of moving ahead, but whatever she tried seemed to turn to dust. And finally, she was just feeling so very lost. She was worried that she wouldn't be a good mother. And she left her, her two daughters with her family. And she got on her motorcycle and went on a road trip. She wasn't trying to lose her responsibilities as she was trying to run from her pain. And so this young woman was on her motorcycle. And she went from place to place, starting down in Mexico, and all the way up into Washington State just finding, trying to find some way to get away from the pain in her life, get away from the fact that she felt like such a failure and she didn't know what to do. And you see, it's, it's people like that that Jesus wants to come and reach. It's needy folks like that, that who Jesus wants to receive his light. And so the question we're 
going to be asking the text today as we come along is, okay, what can a woman like Laura learn about Jesus, about salvation from this text? Let's stand together and we'll look at John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4 down through verse 30. Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar... The woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. May the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. So we're looking into this passage in John, and we're made aware of this story that that probably is quite well known to us. This woman who was coming out out of the town and happened to meet Jesus at the well. Uh, And so I think you'd be quite comfortable if I were to label this passage, the light comes to Samaria. Because Jesus has been speaking of himself as the light and he's come to Samaria. And our question is, how is he going to interact with this needy woman? Uh, And it seems random, doesn't it? Jesus has come from one direction. She comes from another direction. Uh, it, it, It seems like nobody planned it. But we know that God above planned it. 
And so we want to pay close attention to how it all develops because she really isn't a random person. The first thing we're going to notice is that Jesus reveals himself as Messiah. So he's coming into the world, he is the light, and he wants her to understand all of the power, all of the majesty that, that he represents and how he is able to really help her. He wants her to begin to understand that, and that's one of the big themes in this passage, Jesus revealing himself as Messiah. But he doesn't just want to speak to her about the big picture. He doesn't just want to speak to her about who he is. He wants to make it personal for her. And so one author has described the passage this way, that in this passage we find Jesus that tells a woman everything she ever did and then draws her to everything she ever needed. Isn't that amazing to think about? That Jesus comes to us and he wants to speak to us. He knows who we are. He knows everything we've ever done. He knows all of the dumb things, all of the mean things, all of the tragic things in our lives. And he wants to come and give us everything we ever really needed, eternal life the thought of being able to live with him throughout eternity. So wonderful and so blessed. So God is, is working in this woman because he knows her intimately, and he wants to work in us intimately as well. And uh, we want to be listening to this and not just thinking about it. We want to be opening our hearts up to it as well. Uh, and that's a sketch of what we're going to be looking at. So we'll summarize it this way. First, we'll go back to a couple weeks ago when we looked at Salvation Explained. Uh, you remember then we said that, we talk, that Jesus first talked about transformation to Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again, right at the beginning of their discussion. So he wanted Nicodemus to understand that that was the goal, being spiritually transformed. If you want to know what salvation is all about, that's what it's about, Nicodemus, Jesus was saying. So be born again is what he started with, and then uh, he talked about himself as the light of the world, as the one who was coming to save all men, all people. And we can see that. Jesus came to save the world. That's what we were talking about two weeks ago. Today's going to be a little bit different because it takes the... Uh, the, those ideas, and it puts them in a different order so we can see how it works. That was a little more, that two weeks ago was a little more a, 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 a theoretical framework, and this is going to be the practical framework. So this time we start with the light of the world, and we're going to see Jesus revealing himself to this Samaritan woman. And as he reveals himself, as she begins to get a sense of just who he is and just what he can do for her, then he's going to talk about transformation. Then uh, he's going to speak to her reality. He's going to talk about what's really going on with her and how she can then be spiritually transformed. So let's dig in. We're talking about the light of the world. And uh, it's, I think it's really helpful just to look at how Jesus brings this into the conversation. We, uh, we begin with John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was, from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. This is the setting. Jesus has been on the road. Uh, you'll remember in the last section we looked at, Jesus had been down around Jerusalem, somewhere out into the countryside, and he had now undertaken a three-day journey to move back up to Galilee, which is where his experience with the disciples had started. And uh, on that journey then, he's been walking all morning. When it says it was about the sixth hour, uh, that would mean it would be about noon. They typically would start 
counting the hours at 6 in the morning when the sun came up. And so it would be about noon. And Jesus has been walking a long time, and he is truly tired. He, he was, remember, man. And so he felt that tiredness. And he comes to the well, and he sits down there on the well. And, and he's knackered. He's pooped. And that's when uh, the woman comes along. That's when uh, the, the, the action begins to develop. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? On the surface, that sounds quite normal, doesn't it? On the surface, uh, a tired man sitting by a well, someone comes along that has a bucket and a dipper, Uh, You know, it it would be perfectly normal to ask her for a drink. But back then, things were different. Uh, Jesus was alone. In verse 8, we are reminded that the disciples had gone into town to find some food. Back then, you didn't uh, pack a lunch. It wouldn't keep in the heat and so on. So they'd gone into town to find some food. And that meant this was an awkward question. Because here's a man talking to a woman with nobody around, no chaperones or anything like that. And it, it, that's the first sense we get of it being awkward. It's more awkward than that. Uh, the the uh, woman says to him in, in 4 verse 9, I, uh, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There was a real prejudice at work here. The uh, Samaritans had uh, been a part of Israel early on. They had uh, broken away after King Solomon and had tried to create their own kingdom. And you have the history of the two kingdoms in the Old Testament. And they'd also been taken over by by the uh, other countries around. and, And they hadn't fared so well as Judea. They, they'd been uh, more corrupted by the religions of those that had taken them away into captivity. And so they, their religion was no longer pure as it once had been. As a result, there was this tension because they didn't want to be looked down on even though they had fallen away from God. And so they were always trying to prove themselves and, and there had been various back and forth fights between the Samaritans and the Jews between Samaria and Jerusalem. So that was part of the, the prejudice that was going on. Part of it's because she's a woman. Part of it's because uh, she's a Samaritan. And they, they just don't get along. And the other thing that's interesting in this text is uh, she comes along and she says... Uh, How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. That phrase, Jews do not associate with uh, with Samaritans, can be taken a slightly different way in the Greek. Uh, And it it could also be uh, translated, for Jews do not use dishes Samaritans have used. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever had Jewish friends that were uh, keeping a kosher home. But the Jews living in a kosher home go to great lengths to make sure that they use the right utensils at the right time. They don't want to mix up utensils that have been used with milk and utensils that haven't. Uh, it's, it goes back to not cooking a, a calf in its mother's milk and has been greatly amplified down through the years. They can be so particular about those things. We once had Jewish neighbors who were becoming more devout and they had to go through and take all of their kitchen utensils and and get rid of them because they might have been contaminated and so they needed to have a new set to use with meats and they needed to have a new set to use with milk. And so that's the, the, the extent to which Jews were careful about these things. And so when it came to Samaritans, when it came to these people that they were so prejudiced against, they they didn't want to use a dipper that a Samaritan had used. 
And so even though Jesus was there and he was tired, even though it was entirely practical for him to be able to use the dipper the woman had, had brought with her, with her water jar, uh, it, it, it was not the right thing to do because Jews don't share utensils with Samaritans. Those are the prejudices that were going on. That's the tension that's there. And what we're going to see is that that the light has come into the world. And Jesus, as the light coming into the world, is going to break down those prejudices. He's not going to pay attention to that. He's going to carry on talking to this woman. He's going to make sure that she learns about the salvation that he's offering to her. He isn't going to allow any of that junk, that prejudice, to slow him down. And it, it's so helpful for us to think about that uh, because there's an irony that begins to, to develop here, right? Here's this woman that fully understands all the prejudices. She's uh, had a rough life and she's had a lot of people look down on her. She, she understands the prejudices and, and she thinks that this is a man who's going to be worried about becoming unclean by being close to her. And what she doesn't know is that this is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that he can make her clean by being present with her. Isn't that wonderful to think about? Jesus comes to make her clean. Jesus comes to share the light with her so that she can be saved. It's, it's wonderful to think about. And Jesus moves into that when he says this in, in 4.10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. See, Jesus is not content to simply come along where we are and hang out with us. He doesn't want to leave us in our troubles and our issues. He wants to come and uh, and change our circumstances. He wants to lead us to spiritual transformation. And so this is a self-declaration. Uh, it's going to intrigue the woman, but it's, it's so important for us to see that he would not let her alone in her state, even though so many people would have just seen her going down the street and walked on the other side. Jesus wasn't willing to do that. Jesus had to get engaged with her. And so he begins to tell her who he is. Uh, she doesn't get the picture. It's, it's rather awkward because he's wanting to, her to understand. Uh, Sir, uh, you have nothing to draw water with, she says, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? She, she doesn't understand spiritual reality yet. She's just dealing with her practical circumstances. This is the guy without the jar, without the, uh, the dipper to, to be able to get a drink, and yet he's telling her that he has spiritual water for her. It's not making any sense understandably, but she's, she's still interacting with Jesus. She's still keeping the door open, and, and so Jesus goes further. And we see, we see this then. Uh, everyone who drinks this water uh, will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Wow, he really wants her to get it, doesn't he? Here she is. She has all sorts of issues going on in her life. And he wants her to understand, you are thirsty, woman. You are thirsty. You need the water I have to offer you. Listen to me. He's, he's, he's trying to help her to understand. And, and that that starts to get through. You see, when Jesus speaks, when we use the word of God, it's like a two-edged sword, isn't it? Sharper than any two-edged sword. And so he's, he's giving her these words, and it stirs her. And we go on to verse 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The spiritual transformation is starting. She's starting to see that there's a solution, and she wants Jesus to tell her more about it. 
she's still stuck in her physical reality. Uh, you know, she's asking for the water. If the, if the passage had just stopped at, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty, that, that, that would have sounded a little more positive. But she goes on, so I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. See, it was a pain for her. Here it is, noonday. She's out in the noonday sun, carrying a water jar, going out, dipping into the well, going through all that work to get water. And there's this other side. There's a a taste of spiritual desire, but there's this other side as well where she's still just stuck in, man, my life is messed up, and if you can make it better, please help me. And Jesus isn't deterred by that. Her motivation isn't perfect. But his love is ready to overcome imperfect motivation. And so he just keeps going. Uh, She has desire. And Jesus sees that spark of desire. And he wants to help her with it. So now he's going to be encouraging her to transform. He's going to help her to understand that she can be spiritually changed. And find salvation in him. And so... That's a personal process, so Jesus gets personal. Uh, And he moves into talking about transformation. He told her, go call your husband and come back. That was the elephant in the room. Jesus knew all about it, being the son of God, uh, but she never would have volunteered this information that's about to come out. She never would have wanted him to know that that she had such a checkered past. And and Jesus is about to tell her very clearly that he knows about the other husbands and he knows that the man she's with is not her husband. He's moving in that direction, but it begins with this. And it begins slowly so that she has the opportunity to admit to it slowly. None of us like admitting to our issues, do we? None of us like to talk about our bad habits or the, the, the ways we've mistreated people or the, the problems that we've gotten ourselves into down through the years. And so Jesus comes along and he takes us step by step through a process so that we can gradually begin to fully admit to all the junk that goes on in us. That's what he's starting to do here. What's interesting is that he doesn't want to rub her nose in it. He doesn't come along and say, "Uh, I know you're a a wretched woman. I know all the evil that you've been involved in. He doesn't do that. He simply states the facts. Because he wants her to understand that he has seen all of these dynamics in her life. And he wants to help her with them. He wants to get down to the facts so that things can change. And and so the woman is responding, and we go down to verse 19, and she says, "Uh, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. She's catching on. This isn't just some guy that's been walking down the road. This is someone who has real spiritual insight. She's still confused, and so in verse 20, she goes on about, uh, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she's, she's beginning to see, okay, you have the real goods, Jesus, but I still don't understand. I'm a Samaritan, and I'm stuck with these misconceptions about I worship here, and Jews worship in Jerusalem, and I don't understand how this all works together. Uh, but, uh, but Jesus wants to cut through all that. And so we come down to verse 21. Uh, and he says, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He's, he's, he's telling her that things are going to radically change between, from everything that she's experienced so far. He's telling her, look, I'm bringing in a whole new order. The time is coming when everything is going to be different. He goes on, you Samaritans, 
uh, worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the, from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And you see, he's, he takes the beginning of her understanding... She still can't quite get it because of the situation she's been in and the bad theology she's heard down through the years. And he describes it for her. You think, you Samaritans, that, that you have it pretty good your way and the Jews have a better understanding, but still they don't get it. And a time is coming. A time is coming, he says, when... True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is bringing in a whole new order, and it isn't going to be based on the systems that you're used to. It isn't going to be based on the Samaritan system, and it isn't going to be based on the Jewish system. It's going to be a whole new system where worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. And he wants her then to begin to realize that he is working outside the boundaries of anything that she's learned up until that point. And she can find a new life if she will only listen to him. And so she's boggled. She tries to talk about the Messiah in verse 25. And... uh, and uh, said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. She, she doesn't get it yet, and she doesn't figure this guy she's just met by the well is going to be able to understand it all. And so she's coming back to the real idea of Messiah, the one true thing that Samaritans and Jews believed in. And she says, well, the Messiah is going to be able to describe all that to me. And so Jesus says, Jesus declares... I who speak to you am he. You see, this is the light making full entrance into that woman's situation. He's been bringing her along and bringing her along so that she would get it piece by piece and little by little. And now he says, look, I am the Messiah. All your hopes, all your dreams can be fulfilled in me. And it's a wonderful moment. It's, it's such an amazing thing to think about that Jesus would come to this woman with all of her issues, all of her problems, and he would make that declaration to her. Well, at that point, the, the story changes a little bit. The disciples come back. And, and a bunch of guys who have only been thinking about lunch now come to Jesus and see him talking to a woman. And... They're flat-footed, as guys can sometimes be, and don't get it. They're holding their tongues, but just barely. They're just wondering, what in the world is going on here? Why are you talking to this woman? You know, all the prejudices still live in them. Uh, And so things get awkward, but the woman isn't going to be deterred by that because she has met the Messiah, and he is changing her life. And so she leaves her water jar, She wants to get right into town. She wants to tell people the good news. And this is what she says. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. It's amazing, isn't it? Because she doesn't have a, a, a wonderful story. When she's telling people that this guy knows everything I ever did, uh, that means that he knows the gory details. That means that that he knows the junk, and yet she's happy that someone knows about that now. And knowing about it, he still loves her. And loving her, he's offering her life, eternal life. He's the Messiah. He's offering her eternal springs of living water. And she wants to tell the whole village about it. She wants to spread the good news. And, you know, it's interesting. Back when Jesus was first encountering his disciples, he was in the 
uh, circle around John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was pointing to men to follow him, and they came along and, and awkwardly tried to see if they could hang out with him, and, and Jesus said, come and see. Jesus, the Messiah, speaking to two disciples of John, all of these upright people said, come and see. But now the grace of God has gone further and deeper. And so here is a Samaritan woman. A woman that the Jews think of as an outsider. A woman that the Jews think of as just a woman. And with all of her troubles in her life, now she is the one that's going to an entire village. And she is the one saying, come and see. Doesn't that illustrate the beauty of the grace of God? That we who don't deserve to be at all involved in, in God's work, we get included? Even an outsider? Even a person with a troubled past? That they get to be included in, in sharing the gospel, saying, come and see what God can do? It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. And so we can see that What's going on here in salvation being modeled is that Jesus' light shines on people's needs. Jesus comes and he sees the issues and he wants to help us. And he helps us and, and we know that the only one that could have helped us was God. And so it, it means lives are transformed. And it means that what one of the things that Jesus said to Nicodemus begins to come true. Remember, he said to Nicodemus, people come into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. We need to be grounded in that. We, we, we never can think of ourselves as having deserved our salvation. We always must understand that uh, we come to the light as Jesus is working in us. It's being done through God. God is blessing us. We don't deserve it. It's been done through him. And so we want to then move and think about application. And I'll come back to the story I started telling you about Laura, and maybe you can see how it fits in with the biblical story we've been talking about. As I mentioned, Laura had been on that road trip trying to outrun her, her fears and her troubles and her problems and had gone all the way by motorcycle from Mexico on up to Washington State. And eventually she got over to uh, South Dakota, uh, Mitchell, South Dakota, a little town in a, in a very flat and cold in the winter sort of place. And she knew about motorcycles, so she was able to help out in a motorcycle shop. And the question then becomes, okay, it, there isn't a well. There, Jesus isn't going to be sitting by a well. So how is this woman with all of her needs going to find out about Jesus? And what happened was the guy that ran the motorcycle shop invited her to church. And she wasn't even sure if she should go. She, she wasn't even sure if it's what she wanted, but she ended up going. And the pastor talked about God's love that morning. The pastor talked about how the father looks down in love and, and wants to reach out to his children and wants to help us. And how Jesus came and died for us so that we could be made clean, so that we could be made whole. And on that morning, just like the woman at the well, she responded to the gospel and she asked Christ to become her savior. And she was born again. She was transformed. God's worked in her life. She's been able to see God help her transform her relationships with her children, which were understandably very difficult. She's gotten married and has a stable marriage now. God is blessing her, just like he blessed the woman long ago at the well. One thing she said is that when you really think about it, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you, it changes everything. 
She says, I'm a different person. I have worth. I'm a new person. And it's, it's just like the woman at the well, isn't it? And it means that God can come along and work in our circumstances and help us to share the light with the people around us, just like Jesus shared with a woman at the well. So our application then is, are we sharing Jesus at the well? You know, it's, it's, it's great as a Christian to come and read this passage and rejoice that, that God is uh, working in us and that we've been spiritually transformed and, and he's helping us and we're experiencing him as Messiah. But are we sharing that good news? I don't think any of us have to go out to a well and, and draw water. Uh, 50 or 100 years ago, people in this region might still have done that, but not us. We can go to the tap. So sharing Jesus at the well isn't the direct, the direct picture we want to be dealing with, but I think we want to remember the meaning of what sharing at the well is all about. See, Jesus went into a situation where the woman was looking for something important. She needed water because she was thirsty. She needed water for her household. She needed water for whatever other reason, but she needed it. And so Jesus entered into a conversation with her at that point. Jesus wanted her to understand the bigger picture, and he worked with where they were at. And so Jesus comes to us, and he can work with us when we're, when we're in the workplace. If you've got an awkward boss or you've got awkward coworkers, Jesus can help you in that situation so that you can be a light shining to them. If, if you're at home and you have difficult relationships, Jesus can work through you there. Jesus can help you share with your neighbors on your block. So many things Jesus can do. And we need to grasp the idea that he is this living water who works in any circumstance, not just at wells back in Israel. And the reminder then is, <clears throat> people do not put a light under... <clears throat> people do not... Light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to the whole house. That's one of the foundational principles of Jesus. And so we are talking about this light that has come into us, and now we have a chance to share it with people around us. That's a process that's already going on. <clears throat> I was encouraged the other day at uh, Young at Heart to see so many friends that had been invited along to t take part. And there's, there's many more friends and many more people we know in our connections that can also come to the light. And my, my prayer is that we would take up that vision, that each one of us would understand that we have something to share with whoever it is that we encounter day by day in our, in our daily lives. So we, we come with those examples and we come now to the end of our service. We're going to be celebrating communion. Let's just pray as we celebrate the wonder of communion that God would help us to bear these principles in mind. Let's pray. Lord, we are glad this day that we were reminded that you opened up your arms wide to us when you died on Calvary. And we are thankful this day that we have been able to look into your word and, and understand how you open up your arms wide to real people. And we're reminded how you want us to be a part of that process. So as we have looked into your word, help us not to uh, forget about it, but help us to be stirred by it. And as we celebrate this communion, remind us of the depth of your love so that that also might stir us to truly live for your glory. Amen.